It's my privilege to introduce our speaker, and uh, Pastor Casey uh, is right in front of me to my right. One thing that I can say about Pastor Casey now, almost all of you know that she is um, going to Mozambique uh, in her last month, will be August with us, uh, at the end of August. And so I asked her months ago to prepare a message. And one thing that I am so blessed about Pastor Casey is this thought. You know, when Jesus walked the earth, uh, he didn't just have nice, tidy, neat situations where everybody was sitting in rows and he was talking to them. That happened, but uh, most of the time, you can stay up here, I'm not gonna be long, it's fine. Uh, most of the time, Jesus had experiences where he had to do on the spur of the moment and spoke to people and you know, interruptions and all kinds of issues and a lot of chaos and issues again. But Jesus always maintained his calm. He maintained his spirit. He spoke into the situations. And I have admired that about Pastor Casey. She has Jesus in her. And if you know anything about life with children and what happens in the school and every day, there's just all kinds of things. It's like you're in the middle of interruptions all the time. That's part of life. And rather than um, being frustrated and just kind of like, I, I just see that she just handles them with grace and love and she has the spirit of Jesus in her to do that. So we just appreciate her so much. And uh, so Pastor Casey, uh, give us the word. We'll be attentive. We will listen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. So my message comes from the book of 2 Kings, uh, chapter 2. And I'll be reading from verses uh, 1 through uh, 15. 2 Kings, chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. It says, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So I went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took off his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right, to the right, and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariot and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. They took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. The company of the prophets of Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word, God. I thank you, uh, Lord, for these words that you have given me, but I pray, Lord, that you would help me to speak, Lord, that you would have me to speak. I pray, Lord, that you would prepare your people's hearts, so God, to receive the message that you have from them. We love you and we thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
The story of Elisha taking on the mantle of Elijah intrigues, inspires, and it challenges me. Elijah has been referred to as the man of power. What a fitting description of a man who prayed one prayer and stopped praying for falling for three and a half years. What a fitting description of a man who withstood the prophets of Baal on the top of Mount Carmel and outran a king in a chariot on foot. <coughs> brought God brought Elisha across his path. This powerful man began a process of training and mentoring that would eventually lead Elisha into his own experience with the power of God that we've come to know as the double portion experience. Elisha is greatly impressed by this prophet's community with God and he longs to have his own walk with the Almighty. He was God hungry. God seeks today for such people, people that can say with David in Psalms 42 on, as the heart that panted after the water brook, so my soul panted after thee, O God. But as I look over this passage, I see three distinctives that, that go along with Elisha's experience. And they will also characterize any encounter that we have with God. The first one that I see is that Elijah, Elisha, Elisha, Elisha was insistent on receiving the double portion. He was willing to stay a little bit closer, go a little bit farther, and he wanted a little bit more. You will notice that out of all the schools of the prophet, only Elisha's name was mentioned. That was because the others were content with following from afar. That is a story of many people. They can, they're content with a relationship from a distance. Just close enough, but not near enough that it's going to start costing them. We see that in verse 6, that Elisha was willing to go a little bit farther. It says, and the two went on. If you can visualize this story, here's the old prophet Elijah, and here's the young man of God, Elisha. And no matter where Elijah went, Elisha was going to be one step behind him. I find that there was three occasions that Elijah was trying to get Elisha to stay behind. The first one we see is in verses 1 through 2. We see that Elijah tried to get him to stay in Gilgal. This was a historical and a significant place. The place where the anointing oil had been poured out by Samuel upon Saul. Gilgal is the place where the children of Israel had come after they had crossed the Jordan River. It was at Gilgal where Joshua had erected the 12 stones as a witness of what God had done. Gilgal means standing stone or witness. But they had to leave their comfort zone, their traditions, their family surroundings. They had to leave what they were used to because it was part of the process. They were going to bring about a change. It re re represents the place of sacrifice. But Elisha went further. We see in verses 3 to 4 that they had come to Bethel. Their very name of Bethel means the house of God. The place where Jacob heard the renewed promise of God first given to Abraham. Elijah said to Elisha, why don't you stay here in Bethel? But Elisha knew that he had to go through the process. He wasn't worried about making a name for himself. He wasn't worried about a title, but he wanted uh, to endure with power. So he said to Elijah, as the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. He understood that there was still something he needed to learn from Elijah. In order to learn, he had to go through the process. So Elisha went further. We see in verses 5 through 6 that they had come to Jericho. And Jericho represents the place of victory where enemies are conquered. Elijah and Elisha leave Bethel. They've come to Jericho. And Jericho means a place called unpleasant. Although its name is pleasant, Jericho is barren, dry, lifeless, unresponsive, unmoving, motionless, and dead. There were no trees, no flowers, no fruit anywhere. Because the water had everything been withered up because of the poison that had infiltrated the water supply of Jericho. Elijah looked at what was going on and he said to Elisha, why don't you just stay here? But Elisha knew that he had to go through the process. So he said, I will not leave you. So Elisha went further. You can't stay at Bethel, you can't stay at Gilgal, you can't stay at Jericho. None of these places are going to bring you where the devil portion of Christian lives. You have to cross over the Jordan. You have to get to where the glory is about to fall. There are places all along our Christian walk that we can stop. Places of ease and comfort where one can settle and decide they're not moving any further. But if you are serious about receiving the double portion anointing, then you cannot be content with settling. You have to be insistent. I noticed an important thing is that the other prophets tried to discourage Elisha. Elijah tried to persuade Elisha to lag behind. But Elisha wouldn't have any part of it. He said, I am going all the way to glory and nothing else matters in my life. 
Elijah replied, nevertheless, if you see me, then I sh it shall be granted. The anointing is in sheep. The power of God has a price. Elijah, just, just because he wanted something, he, just because he said he wanted the anointing, it wasn't going to be enough. He had to be willing to go that extra mile. One of the great men of God years ago was a man with a nickname, Praying High. He was a missionary to the Indians. And during his life, there was many supernatural miracles and healings that took place. After he died, the discovery was made of the secret behind his ministry. Next to his bed, there were two indentions on the wood floors. And after some research, it was found out to be imprints from his knees on the floor where he had prayed. The devil portion people of today will not be those who are content for to settle for less when they know that there's so much more that is available. A passive and numb crowd will not receive what God is pouring out today. There's a level of insistence that moves God. A level that says the spiritual things are concerned. I will not take no for an answer. But not only was Elijah insistent, he was also ignited by the devil portion. The instructions were for Elisha, see me when I am taken from you, and the double portion will be yours. As Elijah was leaving in the chariot of fire, he dropped his mantle down to the ground. Elisha had to now respond and pick up that mantle. I don't know how much anointing Elisha had in his clothing, but he realized that it wasn't going to be enough. He needed the mantle of Elijah with a promise of a double portion attached to it. But before he could put on that new mantle, he had to take off his old one. He had to take off his old clothes and rent them in two pieces. And that old clothes, they represent the old walk in life. Elisha had to be willing to not only use his words and say what he wanted to be done with his old life, but he had, to willing, he had to be willing to back it up with his own actions. So many times we know the right things to say, but it's our actions that are really going to matter. Are you done with your old life? Are you willing to shred your old garments in two and put on the mantle of the double anointing? It's going to cost you. It could cost you friends. It could cost you your lifestyle. But are you willing to pay the price? With the mantle in Elisha's hand, he moves back to the Jordan River that he and Elijah had crossed earlier. Elijah had used the mantle to part the water going across. And now Elisha uses the same method going back. He wanted to find out if this was going to work for him. He parts the water crying, where is the Lord God of Elijah? He was no longer interested in the man of God, but rather the God of the man. Where are your eyes focused today? We see that Elisha is a man of fire, no longer a apprentice, but a prophet, no longer a learner, but a leader, no longer would he just tag along, but he would now terrorize the forces of the devil. The double portion will ignite an individual. It will ignite you. It will turn your fear into faith, your trembling into triumph, your impediments into inspiration, your signs into singing. All one has to do is look at Elisha's life and his miracles to know that his desire was granted. The widow's son was raised. The widow's oil was increased. And the dead man was raised um, by, having his, uh, by touching Elisha's bones. And the last thing that I see is not only was he ignited, and not only was he ins uh, insisted, but he was also identified. We see in verse 15 that upon returning to the sons of the prophet of Jericho, they declared, the spirit of Elijah doth rest upon you. He was identified by the spirit that went before him. And the spirit of God will identify us just the same way. What aroma are you giving off? What are you identified by? You can't become a double portion Christian on accident. You must purpose in your heart to have all that God has for you. To not settle, to not sell out. We must take the first step to activate the power of God in our lives. There was once a great violinist that had finished a wonderful performance. And a lady who had been so moved, which the man had said, I would give my life to play like you. He said, that's what it takes, for I have given mine. Are you willing to give up your life your, to be identified, your identity, to be identified with Jesus and the anointing that he desires for you to have? When we look at the story of Elisha, we see that he had to give up a lot to receive the anointing. He had to put up with discouragement from the other students. He had to put up with Elijah telling him to only go so far. It wasn't an easy road, and it won't be an easy road for you. But Elisha had counted the cost 
and he was willing to sell out. He was willing to go a little farther, get a cl little closer than all the rest, and desire even more than he had already had. Oftentimes, we want to see great miracles in our lives. We want to be part of great things in the work of God. But we're not willing to pay the price. You can't have it both ways. You either have to be all in or you're all out. God is looking for someone that desires the double anointing. God wants to do a new thing. And he needs Elisha to pick up that mantle that will not compromise. God needs Elisha that will expose and deal with sin. God needs Elisha that will die out to self and self-centeredness and say, Here I am, Lord. Send me. God needs Elisha who fear the Lord and not man. God needs Elisha that worship in the spirit and truth and move beyond spectatorship and entertainment. God needs Elisha who will say, for God I live and for God I die. God needs Elisha who will tell the world, we're not going to stand for this anymore. God needs Elisha that are going to stand for, that will not stand for complacency, lukewarmness, hypocrisy, immorality, profanity, and worldliness. And so today in closing, I leave you with a few questions. How badly do you want that double anointing? And are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to be insistent for that anointing? Are you willing to be ignited and by that anointing to set your life ablaze for Jesus for all to see? And lastly, are you willing to lay aside your own old clothes and be identified with the anointing? Uh, the altars are now open, and I just encourage you guys to come and spend time with Jesus. And to uh, just allow God to just work in your heart and to just say to God, yes, God, I want that anointing. That yes, God, I want more of you.